Hello, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are joining us from. Um, my name is Alexis Foley. I use she, her pronouns. I am an educational program coordinator with the QOI Home Office. Um, and I am grateful that you all have joined us today for um, the 2023 Best of Showcase presentation, um, one of many that we have going on this week and next week. Um, so thank you for joining us. And before we get started today, I have just a couple of announcements here from the home office. Um, first, I did want to share our Best of Showcase full schedule. Um, so we kicked off the Best of Showcase this week. Um, this is week one. Um, and we have today's presentation, um, and then we will have another presentation tomorrow, and we have several, we have three Best of Showcase presentations next week. Um, so you can find out more about these sessions um, on our website. I'll share this link in the chat um, where you can find the full descriptions and the registration links. All righty. Also, I'd love if you all checked out our QOI calendar for other upcoming events. Um, we have a lot of great events coming up in addition to the Best of Showcase. Um, so we do have our content conferences happening in Columbus, Ohio in just a couple of weeks. Um, registration is still open for the content conferences if you'd like to attend. Um, we'll also have our STARS College happening on October 15th, 22nd, and the 29th for um, emerging student affairs professionals or students who are interested in the student affairs and campus housing profession. Um, we'll have our Multicultural Institute um, taking place virtually um, October 24th and 25th. Um, and then our Living Symposium will be taking place virtually on November 30th. Um, so all of those events are on the QOI website. Um, I will also share the link to our calendar in the chat. Um, also, we are currently recruiting volunteers for the 2024 um, year. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering with one of our committees, one of our networks, um, the application is open through October 5th. All right. So now I am going to pass it on to Jordan Howe, who is a hall director at the Georgia Institute of Technology um, and the CEO Best of 2023 winner um, for her Best of Showcase presentation. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alexis. Um, so before we get started, I know that this is a lot of folks lunch hour, post-lunch hour, pre-lunch hour. We're in the middle of a work day. Um, and this is a wellness presentation. So I want you sitting in your desk. Um, uh, I want you to know that there will be no breakout rooms in this session. So give a nice sigh of relief. Do your little woosah. Um, before we get started, let's do some, get some stretching in, you know, wiggle your arms, stretch your back. You've been sitting at your desk all day. Loosen it up, let some stress go away. Okay, um, and let's talk about burnout and well-being. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, my expectations for you as a participant today are to um, take in, um, listen to new ideas, reflect on how they agree or disagree with your current ideas. Um, the only interaction that I'm gonna ask from you is gonna be via the chat. So um, I'm also going to ask that you engage in some reflection on your own. So if you want to get out a little notebook, a little sheet of paper, um, your notes app on your phone, whatever is accessible to you, those are the ways that you're going to have to actively participate in this session today. So want to make it low barrier to entry, very accessible. Um, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Make sure I can view the chat. Very nice. Okay. Um, uh, so today we are talking about um, disrupting the pain Olympics in the high achieving student population. Um, something that I often respond to students with a uh, weird flex, um, but okay. 
um, in this idea of recognizing, disrupting, and redirecting some unsustainable behaviors. So um, uh, first off, to introduce myself, my name is Jordan Howell. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a residence hall director here at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, today, it's raining outside, so it's a little bit of a bummer here, but normally it's pretty warm and toasty. Um, hope it's comfy wherever you are. And um, this is my first job post-grad school, but um, I went to grad school at Texas A&M, and that's where I got my first experience as a graduate hall director. Um, moving forward, I want to take a second to talk about why. So um, my why for being interested in serving this high achieving student population um, is really centered on my experience, uh, both as a student, as an RA myself, and then my professional experience. So um, when I was a student, I was in this high achieving student population. So uh, I participated in a honors and service style living learning community um, that really promoted involvement um, at the University of South Carolina, where I did my bachelor's. And when I was an RA, I supported um, a STEM population. And we know STEM, they're high achievers. They got a lot of stuff they want to do very quickly all at once. Okay. Um, so uh, when I went to grad school, the student population that I served was a high achieving honors like STEM population. So um, very wound up students who have a lot of things that they want to achieve and they want to do it all on day one, um, which is super intriguing and not how that works at all. Um, so what really got me interested in this idea of the pain Olympics um, and this like competitive nature of collegiate institutions is uh, I got my staff together and I, a beginning activity that I do with my staff is that we get together and we create a mission statement centered on the environment that we want to create as live-in staff for the folks in our halls. Um, and both at Texas A&M and here at Georgia Tech, the students mentioned wanting to actively combat um, some of the competitive norms um, that they feel with their peers. So um, the bragging, the one-upping, um, this constant feeling of needing to perform um, is something that they didn't feel like positively contribute contributed to their home environment. So that really got me intrigued in this idea of, uh, okay, what can we do as professionals and housing professionals and curating an environment that does not support these unsustainable habits and actively redirects to students towards more sustainable habits? So um, I remember some of my students like directly quoting conversations that they'd have with their friends where people are talking about how much they were studying last night and they just bounce off one another of like, yeah, oh my God, man, like I, I only got like five hours of sleep last night. Oh my God, yeah, I only only got three. That's weird. That brag is weird. And having students come into my office for one-on-ones and be like, yeah, I've been so busy today. I had three org meetings for the um, three executive boards that I'm on. And uh, I only had an iced coffee for breakfast. LOL. Relatable, right? No, bestie. That's not relatable. That's weird. Why are we celebrating this? Um, like, why is there a sense of pride? in this. So um, that is my why. Um, I'd love for you to take a moment to reflect on why you're interested in this topic of supporting high achieving student populations, specifically when it comes to disrupting unsustainable behaviors and cultures. So um, take a second. I'm going to give you one minute on the dot reflect on what your why is in investing in this topic area. If you feel so inclined, would love to hear some whys in the chat, um, but give you a minute. You can either write it down or throw her in the chat of what's your why for participating today.
Okay, awesome. So um, seeing the two that were shared in the chat, um, uh, yes, ring a ding ding to the role modeling, right? <laughs> it's, it's tough. Um, so breaking the cycle um, and being able to walk the talk, we're going to spend a lot of time chatting about that today. So um, I'm glad that's why you're here. Um, relevant to the students that you're working with, um, academic stress culture, she's weird. Let's like talk about it because it's weird that it's weird. Um, and da -da -da, high achieving student populations, mental health, really involved. Um, da -da -da -da. Yeah, it is, it is a flex that happens in so many like different environments. Um, resetting the flexes. Okay. I like that term. I hadn't thought about that resetting the flexes, but yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, thank y'all for sharing with me a little bit about why you're here. Hopefully we can touch on those topics. And if we don't, um, please bring it back up at the end. And if we have time, we can chat about it a little bit. Um, okay. So my learning outcomes for y'all today are three pronged. So recognition, coaching, and role modeling. So um, I want you to be able to recognize those red flags, those pink flags, those slightly off white flags, right? Um, of unsustainable habits, specifically within high achieving student populations. So these are the things that are gonna greatly contribute to burnout, which is you know hot button topic in higher ed right now. Um, we need to be able to recognize the signs of it so we can redirect students before they make it all the way there, right? And then engaging in coaching. So coaching is going to look like interruption and redirection. So um, we want to not only recognize the signs of these unsustainable habits, but we want to do something about it because seeing it and doing nothing about it, there's there's no point in that. Um, and we want students to prioritize their well-being because they're people, right? And then we're going to have some intentional thoughts on role modeling. Um, Got to be able to like turn the looking glass at yourself. So um, we want to make sure that we're trying our best to challenge and support ourselves in the pursuit of sustainable habits because it's a challenge for us in our field too. In order to achieve these learning outcomes, this is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page in our understanding of who our high achieving students are, um, what the pain Olympics are, what's the specific behaviors that we're talking about, and then our two-pronged approach to doing something about it is disruption and redirection. So um, how are we dismantling environments that perpetuate this unsustainable culture, this unsustainable academic stress? And what are we redirecting them towards, right? And then role modeling, walk in the walk. Um, so we're going to have some conversations about that, um, show some gratitude to those that we've seen walk the walk and maybe challenge ourselves a little bit and doing a little bit better of a job at it. All right. So um, uh, you've been punked. This is actually just an opportunity for me to show off cute pictures of my staff. This is my current RA staff. These are the student leaders that I work with, um, and they are all incredibly high achieving. So we I still get lots of practice every day in getting them to prioritize um, things other than internships and a 4.0 GPA. Um, so first, um, let's put it in the chat. Who are our high achieving student populations? Um, what? Who are the students when we say high achieving? Who's the first one that you think of? Um, I'll give you about like 30 seconds to think of something um, and throw it in the chat. Students who all nighter. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that sums it up really well. Um, student leaders, executive board members of organizations. Yeah. Um, something that I typically see when folks are talking about high achieving student populations is that um, it's sort of a Venn diagram, right? You have your high achieving students that are really academically talented um, and they put forth a lot of time and effort into their studies. 
like a lot, a lot more than the average student. Um, they're the first ones to sign up for research. Maybe they're doing more than one research opportunity at a time. They may have multiple internships. Um, they are academically focused, grind set on, right? And then you have our student leaders. These are our future student affairs professionals, let's be honest. Um, so they are the folks who are on the exec board of every single organization that they are involved in. Um, they show up to every single meeting, every single optional social. Um, they are on the committee for everything, right? So these are our folks that are involved in everything and everywhere. All of your professional peers on campus know who they are for some reason or another. And then you have um, the people in the middle who are somehow all of that, um, somehow, some way, um, and meet both aspects of this idea of a high achieving student population. So being aware of where in this sort of Venn diagram that the student that you're thinking about sits in is really important because you learn about their motivations um, and the ways that you can challenge and support them to still meet their goals while supporting their own well-being. So, um, uh, okay, yeah, Greek life involvement, that's going to be on our on our high achieving org side. And then students who use their room as a place to sleep, and that's literally it. Yes. So um, folks who are either never in their room or they're always in their room studying um, are who our high achieving student population is. So um, when we think of the pain Olympics, um, this is something that I define as this sort of fight to make sure that you're winning this game of who's suffering the most. So students take a lot of pride in doing hard things, as we all should, right? Doing hard things is impressive and you should be proud of yourself for things that you accomplish. Um, but it's when it takes a step too far and it contributes to this really over competitive environment um, and this over commodification of resilience um, bragging about being unwell. Um, resilience should not be something that you consider to be your number one, most present, most valuable um, leadership trait. Um, that pride and suffering is weird uh, and it's not sustainable and it doesn't contribute positively to your well-being. So um, those are not the only things that we should be that we should be proud of. Um, and the Pain Olympics perpetuates this idea of uh, we should celebrate and be proud of things being uncomfortable and things being bad rather than challenging that. Um, so these things uh, actively contribute to burnout. So um, I want us to think a little bit about um, what the sort of impact on student well-being is um, when uh, we think of this issue of the pain Olympics. So want to give you about 30 seconds, throw her in the chat. Um, what do we think the impact the pain Olympics has on student well-being and our campus environments and the sort of environment that we promote? Okay, yeah, the anxiety, this like feeling of performing all the time, fear of missing out, feeling like you're not doing enough compared to what you think everyone else is doing, the stress addiction, yes, this um, I need to be busy all the time um, is weird, okay? Lack of satisfaction. So um, students that when they're not at this like full capacity feel like they're not doing enough, even though they're doing more than enough, um, is is really harmful to their ability to um, like succeed and persist. So um, uh, everyone's stressed to the max. They're getting physically sick. Yes. Um, uh, crossing boundaries, neglecting their needs because everyone else is doing it. Um, uh, focusing more on other people's well-beings. Yep. Unrealistic understanding. Yep. Um, 
Yes. Not being able to be fully present in their experiences. Um, I always notice a shift from sophomore year to junior year, sophomore years when um, students feel they got everything under wraps. So now they're going to join all the orgs that they wanted to join freshman year, but they didn't. And then they get burnt out. And then junior year, they come back and they decide that they're only going to join two. And they're going to really try to be present in those organizations. Um, the uh, positivity that they have towards those experiences in that junior year when they kind of like wind down the things that they put forth effort and time in and try to be intentional about being present in those places is amazing right um uh, da -da -da, perfectionism failure feels permanent 100 percent. okay cool beans i'm glad that we're all on the same page here so um this is if you remember nothing else this idea that collegiate environments that celebrate and normalize over involvement are failing to support students fight against burnout. So if we do not challenge this idea of stress addiction, over involvement, pain Olympics, we are of no help to our student population that are in this time in their life, setting up habits that they're going to use in the professional world. So we need to be that person who uh, says, uh, nah, 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 you're doing too much. You don't need to do this much. You can be successful doing less and taking care of yourself. We want to make sure that we're setting them up for success um, in the real world, right? Um, uh, ooh, whatever it takes. Oof, oof, oof. I hate that. Um, uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> that's a weird celebration. Um, is is this whatever it takes culture or this grind set? Um, that's weird. So um, we want to make sure that we are someone in this student's life that can say, um, uh, I think you're doing too much. And I think it's negatively impacting your well-being. Um, uh, <laughs> so I was just laughing at the um, frowny face reaction to that. Um, me too, Bethany. Okay. So um, this is my staff from last year. Um, also in my lap is my cat Bartholomew. He's really cute. This is at our end of semester celebration, um, which I hosted dinner at my apartment. So um, first up in our action steps. So we've recognized an issue. What are we doing about it? Um, disruption is our number one step. So first thing that we want to do is that we want to be able to recognize it. We want to be able to recognize um, when we overhear students amongst themselves engaging in the pain Olympics. And we want to be able to recognize it in our one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, right? So um, if you hear students, let's say your RAs before a staff meeting talking about like, oh, how's your day been, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, like I really, I, I haven't been able to eat today. So I'm like starving. Yeah, I was like up and I was doing all these meetings and things. And then you have another student respond to that with, oh my God, yeah, that was totally me yesterday. Um, I only had an iced coffee and a croissant, LOL. This is where you jump in and be like, hey guys, what's up? Okay, you've recognized it. Um, and then also in one-on-one -on -one meetings, when you're checking with students, hopefully the first question that you're asking students in a one-on-one -on -one meeting is like, hey, how have you been? Um, you need to be able to recognize what in their response is a red flag. And what in their response indicates that they may be participating in some unsustainable behaviors. And then once you recognize it, you want to not feed it, right? So it is very easy when some one of your students says like, um, oh my gosh, um, I wasn't able to sleep last night. And if you didn't get sleep last night, you as a professional to go, oh my God, me too. And then end it at that. It's super easy to like feed into it. Um, and it's super easy to go, yeah, I, gotta, yeah, I remember when I was in undergrad, like I had three all-nighters in a row just to be able to do this thing. LOL, I remember the days. That's feeding it. Don't do that, right? Um, and we want to question it. The best thing that you can do when you have a student who's sharing some sort of signs of unsustainable behaviors is to go, Oh, what do you mean by that? How did that make you feel? Do you really think that that was like the best way to feed your body? Like something that it can feel a little uncomfortable, right? Um, but you want them to start engaging in questioning 
what are their motivations for engaging in behaviors? Um, a lot of times students are going to respond with, um, when they're talking about, you know, maybe they've had to work on a research project to like 3 a.m. every day for like a week. Um, I know that's a common experience here at Georgia Tech. Um, why do you feel like you need to do that? And then the student normally talks about their advisor's expectations, and then you can coach them on how to have boundary conversations with their advisor. And you may be the first person to coach them on how to have those boundary conversations. And that all started from simply asking a question, oh, why do you feel like you need to do that? Um, and then you can have critical conversations that hopefully starts to redirect them towards more sustainable behaviors. All right, talking about redirection. So you've noticed that um, uh, some behaviors, you started to question it, you didn't feed it. Now you've told students they're doing something wrong. You need to tell them the correct thing to do. Um, it would be very weird and uncomfortable if you were just like, oof, that's cringe that you haven't eaten today. <laughs> just like left. Right. That's that's not helpful at all. Um, so we want to help them build positive behaviors. We can't just criticize them and then do nothing. So we want to center our student support in well-being. The ways that I do this in my practice, and I would love for you to reflect on ways that you do it in your own, is that we celebrate self-care as much um, as academic or extracurricular success, especially in group settings. It is really impactful when you can get a group of um, each sharing something that they did for their own well-being and they start like clapping for one another, right? Um, so if you at a staff meeting are someone who normally does icebreakers, um, I implore you to start with um, what is something that you have done to take care of yourself this week? So they're normalizing sharing with their peers ways that they're showing themselves grace. They're celebrating showing themselves grace. They're actively reflecting on, ooh, have I actually done something this week to show care for myself? And they're getting ideas from each other of things that they can do. Oh, this worked for my friend. I'm going to try to do that. So um, celebration has, has so many benefits. And you're actively fighting against this stress addiction culture, addiction culture um, that loves to celebrate suffering. Also, goal setting is really important. So some of these habits are incredibly difficult to break. So we want to establish well-being goals alongside our academic or extracurricular goals in one-on-one -on -one meetings. When I set goals with my RAs at the beginning of the semester, and I do this with my student leaders in the organization that I advise to, we set them in four areas. So we have as a student, as an RA, social well-being. So this is relationships, time they have with friends, how much alone time they get, organization involvements, and personal well-being. All four of these goal areas are weighted the exact same. We, uh, you know, generate ideas for improvement in the same way. We celebrate success in the same way, no matter which of these four areas that we're talking about. And we value growth in all of those four areas the same way. Students have a lot of academic professionals in their lives that are going to prioritize their academic growth and challenging and supporting specifically in academics. We have a unique opportunity as folks who manage their home um, to challenge and support them in well-being too. So um, yes, they are students first, but they can be people first for us right? We can challenge them to grow as people first within our realm. We want to empower students to recognize unhealthy habits in their peers. So I've had lots of critical conversations with my student leaders about this idea of the Pain Olympics, and they've shared their experiences with it and how they've witnessed it. And since defining this issue as a team and recognizing the impact that it can have on students, I have witnessed them to their peers say, oof, you gotta get more sleep, dude. Like, I think that you're cranky because you haven't eaten anything today. Um, and they interrupt in their own circles um, this 
competitive culture. So we're creating change agents in terms of well-being, and that's and it's really important. So um, I'd like for you to reflect for a moment if you have any program ideas or ways that you can redirect students towards healthy habits. So we're disrupting unsustainable behaviors and redirecting towards more sustainable behaviors. Like you think for a moment what opportunities you have in your role to do that. Okay, um, now let's talk about role modeling. So um, obviously I, I made this presentation for um, CEHO in February, um, and this was our residence life staff then. Um, you can't tell from looking at it, but we were severely understaffed. Um, and I was going through and updating photos, but it felt appropriate to keep this photo here um, because a lot of us, around the country in our field are still understaffed and it makes this challenge of role modeling sustainable behaviors even more difficult. Um, so maintaining a focus on well-being and protecting well-being boundaries when you're understaffed is so incredibly difficult. It takes so much energy. It takes support from leadership. It takes support from just the way that your department is structured. Um, so it felt appropriate to um, include this challenge, um, or photo of our teeny tiny staff, um, when thinking about, um, you know, this challenge of role modeling and how it takes a lot of energy to, to do it. So, um, I'd like for you to reflect for a moment. Um, this is something that you can, you can journal. Um, what message does it send to students when we stay in the office from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m.? I remember when I was an RA and my supervisor, um, we had meetings, I think on Wednesdays um, at 8 p.m. And I had my one-on-one, -on -one, I think in the afternoon on Wednesdays. Um, and my supervisor didn't leave their office from the end of the classic nine to five workday to our staff meeting. So when I became a hall director, I was like, oh shoot, I might as well do work since I have to come back anyways. Whoa. That was a weird message to send and receive. Um, that's not normal. Um, and of course you can build schedules in unique ways, but um, what message do we think it sends to students when we aren't prioritizing our own well-being? So what about when we skip lunch to fit in another meeting? Especially at the same time that we're trying to um, challenge our students' behaviors and we're not doing the same thing. Oof. Haley, yes. When you're a grad and you want to, especially at institutions where um, there are graduate hall directors and then there's full-time hall directors that perhaps have a different community size or other responsibilities added on their plate, but portions of your job are the same, the feeling of needing to be able to keep up um, with a full-time professional as a grad student oh, that is such a heavy burden to bear and such an important thing to unlearn. Yeah, um, thank you for contributing that. Okay, um, now I would like for you to reflect for a moment. Who is someone that you know does a good job maintaining boundaries? Who is someone that you know in your professional network that does a good job of role modeling maintaining uh, and valuing their own well-being. So I want to give you like a full minute to think about this one. Um, and if you can, share in the in the chat what gives you this impression that they do a good job at this.
Okay. We're at a minute there. Um, uh, if this was a difficult thing for you to reflect on, um, I would like for you to challenge yourself to start adding things into your routine that makes yourself this person in your department and in your team. Um, I would love for you to work on being the person that others think of when they think of someone that has great boundaries around their well-being. Um, uh, let me see. Um, Heidi, leaving your lunch for your office hour and over time people join you. Yes. Um, we love creating a culture of taking breaks when needed. Yes, we love it. Um, I've also noticed um, the impact that when on call, for example, you um, within your duty team, um, if someone asks for, hey, I've had a rough duty week, can someone take the bag early from me? And then someone does. That's so wonderful because now that has sent a message to everyone in that group that you can ask for help and you are given that help. And it is important that you articulate your own needs for your well being and your own bandwidth. Right. So we want to keep validating those behaviors and I want to empower you um, as folks in your professional networks to do so. Um, so that's awesome. Um, OK. Um, oh, LOL. I forgot this was the next question. Um, what is one way that you do role model sustainable habits and boundaries? So how do you're ahead of the game? Um, yes. Other Heidi, I'm glad that your department encourages this um, of taking a break. And I hope that not only do they encourage it, but they um, put systems in place that make you feel like um, that time off truly is time away. Because um, I think that departments are starting to get better at encouraging professionals to take their time and take time off. Yes. Okay. We love it. Um, but not always are departments as supportive in establishing structures that allow you to step away. So um, it's not so easy to step away when you know that no one else is able to cover for you while you're gone and you're going to have to deal with everything when you come back. Like that's not, that's not a super easy thing to step away from. So, um, uh, ooh, Meetings can't be scheduled until after 4.30 and must end by four. By four. I love that. Um, it's because it allows you to close out your day and have time for admin work. We can't be in meetings all day. It's not sustainable because when are we supposed to get stuff done? Um, three free days after moving. Rewarding the hard at time. Rewarding the hours put in. Yes. Um, da -da 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 -da. Yes, asking your supervisor to role model for you is such a difficult conversation to have, um, but it's beneficial in both directions. So um, I know when my RAs call me out for sending a message um, in Teams after, after my typical hours, I'm like, oof, you're right. You're right, bestie. I shouldn't have done that. Thank you for calling me out on that. And they do it in a respectful way too. Um, so not only do they get practice in recognizing and interrupting unsustainable habits, um, and I get to hear that they value those things, which is awesome. So not responding or sending messages over the weekend. So that is one of the best ways that you can protect your own peace um, and maintain boundaries for yourself. So we can't always control the behaviors of our colleagues, students, um, to respect our time boundaries. So we can't control when students email us over the weekend. We can control whether or not we respond to it and we validate the behavior. We can control that 100%. Um, da -da -da. Your response is a Monday problem. Yes, we want to make sure that we're continuing um, to challenge our peers in that way of, hey, this is something you can totally take care of on Monday. It's Saturday. Live your life. Um, those are wonderful reminders to hear. Um, so I, I want to make sure that I am critically aware of uh, the difficulty in establishing and maintaining boundaries, especially when your work structure um, is not conducive to that. So um, I want to validate uh, the difficulty of that. And uh, I want to take away any shame um, and not being able to keep boundaries all the time. 
There's no shame in that. Um, it is, it's hard, right? But you deserve as a professional um, to try and your students deserve to have a role model um, that talks or walks the walk, right? Because if you're going to be talking the talk to students, like you all shared that you want to do, um, you have to be able to walk the walk for yourself. Okay. Um, so that is all that I have in terms of content delivery. Um, this is my email. If you have any questions, um, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, if you have any like further things that you want to connect about, um, I love having conversations centered around critical well-being um, and interrupting harmful norms. Right. So um, I hope that your takeaways from this presentation are the need to disrupt unsustainable work cultures um, and ways to disrupt them. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, I'll stick around for a little bit. But I very much appreciate y'all. All right, everyone. Well, I just want to give it a second in case people do have questions. Minute. All right. If not, we just want to thank everyone. Thank you, Jordan, for your presentation. First, it was fantastic. Um, I learned a lot, and I know I've got some work to do in these areas myself. So thank you. Um, I am going to share in the chat the AQOI calendar, which will have our upcoming events, including the rest of our best of showcases taking place this week and next week. Um, we hope to see you all at those presentations. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, feel free to reach out to Meredith or myself or whoever the lead is on any of these events. All right. Other than that, have a great rest of your afternoon and a fantastic day. Thank you again, Jordan. <laughs>